When people ask me who's influenced my life in leadership, one of the people at the top of the list is our guest today. We're talking all things leadership with my good friend, Dave Ramsey. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast, where we're on a mission to help you become a leader that others love to follow. If you're new with us, we drop a new teaching on the first Thursday of every month. And so I would encourage you to hit subscribe wherever you consume this content. Also, we have an extra additional resource available to you. It's called the Leader Guide. And I really want to encourage you to get a copy of this. Go to craigrochelle.com, click on leadership, and you can let us know that you want the monthly leader guide. There's all sorts of notes, sometimes additional content, discussion questions, everything you need to cover this with your team or to help to drive the content deeper into your leadership. Also, I'm really excited. On February the 16th, I'm releasing a brand new book. It's called Winning the War in Your Mind, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life, uh, especially in this incredibly complicated season that we're living in in the world today. Our minds can often be out of control. Um, as a leader, we know that the way we think really impacts what we lead. And so I'd encourage you to get a copy of this book. I've also created uh, a five session masterclass. It's called How the Best Leaders Think. We look at five different specific ways that the best leaders think in a different way. If you'd like free early access to this content, you can just simply order a copy of the book. You can pre-order it. Go to craigrochelle.com and there's information how you can get early access to the masterclass. Now, it's an honor to introduce my good friend, Dave Ramsey, who's the author of seven best-selling books, more than 11 million copies sold. Uh, he's one of the biggest radio and podcast teachers in the world today with more than 17 million <laughs> listeners weekly. He created Financial Peace University, and that's uh, content that's honestly changed my own personal life. I've been through it many times, and our church and our staff has been transformed by this amazing content, helping people manage their finances. He leads the Ramsey Solution with about a thousand employees, and he's obsessed with helping people accomplish their goals. One side note, whenever Dave water skis, guess what? This guy does it barefoot. Let's now go to our interview with Dave Ramsey. Well, a big welcome, Dave. Well, thank you, brother. I'm so glad to have you on. I'm honored to be here. I wanted to tell just a little bit of the story before I um, interview you about how uh, I came to know you. It was in the early 1990s, and uh, Amy and I were just married, and we were driving down the road, and we heard this crazy, loud, very opinionated guy on the radio. I don't know anybody like that. And, uh, and you were talking about uh, the freedom of being debt-free, and you, you said, uh, I remember you said, Something along the lines, like if you if if you live like no one else, with real passion, he said, one day you can live and give like no one else. And we were just young, just getting started out, and that message, it uh, it, it resonated with us, and yeah. and we believed it was possible to become debt free, and we followed every one of your baby steps and managed to you know accomplish a lot. And I just want to say thank you to you well, for thank that. Thank you, brother. Then, We've been friends a long time. The other side of the story is I was kind of a Dave Ramsey stalker. You were doing a conference in, uh, again, probably in the 90s in Oklahoma City, and I volunteered to uh, to serve there. And afterwards, we had a dinner, and the people that served got to go to dinner, and uh, that's when we met. Yeah, I think we were at the Logan Steakhouse. The Logan you and I ended up at the same table. We did. I remember, yeah. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. So thank you for your friendship. The uh, reason I'm so passionate about this, uh, the vast majority of our listeners would know who you are, and you've probably helped a lot of them financially. You're kind of known as a... I'm an expert in helping people manage their money, but I know a different side of you that not everybody gets to see. Uh, you're not only a brilliant radio personality, not only a world-class author with 12 million books sold, but you are one of the best of the best of the best leaders. And that's what I want to talk to you about, all things leadership. Uh, your organization is, um, when you walk in, you can just feel in the air that it's well-led. Mm -hmm. Your people are happy. They're productive. It's not an easy place to work. No, it's not. It's not easy at all, but it's um, it's a place that people want to be. And I want to talk to you about that. At some point, I imagine, Dave, you were teaching on finances and trying to help people um, become better stewards. And you recognize that building an organization is really different than teaching. Can you tell me about when you recognized just how important leadership was and what was it that helped you see the value of leading well? 
when I first started hiring people, I was dumb. And so I just hired anybody that wanted a job. I used the mirror test. If you fog up a mirror, we'd hire you. And some guy in a Sunday school class raised his hand looking for a job. All right, let's go. You know, <laughs> hire him. And I, we need, I need some help. You need a job. It's marriage, right? Let's do it. And I, I really was naive in that regard. And, and uh, I looked up with 10 or 12 people, and I was running a zoo. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a toxic mess. Everybody was unhappy. I was unhappy because people weren't being nice to each other. People weren't being nice to the customer. They weren't caring. They, they you know, because I had, you know, I'd brought a bunch of donkeys into the stable and I thought they were thoroughbreds. Well, I think a lot of people might even be able to relate to that in, in the early years of starting a business or a ministry. Sometimes you take whoever's available or if you've been doing it for a long time and you haven't learned to really interview, have a good culture of interviewing, you end up with some of the wrong people. What advice would you give to someone maybe who's in their early years of leadership to be, to have an eye to recognize talent? What do you look for when you're looking for great people to lead with you? Well, we t- teach folks and, you know, and in, to this day in our hiring process, once we've got turned around and figured out how to start doing this stuff, that, that um, talent is worshiped in our culture. Mm-hmm. You know, so-and-so is real talented. Mm-hmm. Um, and for us, uh, talent's secondary. Mm-hmm. Uh, your, the quality of your character, uh, your passion, your um, you, the fact that you care. Pat Lencioni says, hungry, humble, smart. Mm-hmm. They're hungry to get things done. They're humble, meaning it's not all about them. Uh, it's all, it's about winning. It's about the cause. It's about the customer. It's about the people on the other side of the ministry. We're blessed that we'd be a blessing. This place exists for the people outside these walls, hungry, humble, and you're smart. Mm -hmm. We do want smart people. We don't want talented people, but smart also means people smart. Mm -hmm. Can you play well with others? And, And so that's what I'm looking for. And the problem that we get into is if you just say, oh, that person's talented, then you are automatically setting yourself up to bring toxic people in. Mm hmm. Very smart and toxic people. And very smart, toxic people are really good at being toxic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, it's almost impossible to build a quality culture that everybody wants to come to every day when that guy or that gal is in there stirring the soup every day. So um, I really uh, don't care how smart you are. You got to behave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got to be. You got to be. You got to be hungry. You got to be humble, and you got to be smart. People smart in in that process. So the way you look for that is, I had to learn that you have to spend more time in the interview process. And our new recruits, uh, I was sitting with them when they came on board the other day. We had uh, fourteen people start last Monday. We hire about two hundred fifty a year right now. Uh, and, and I'm sitting with them in their on, first onboarding meeting, and they will tell you that getting on with us, it's hard. It's harder to get on with us than it is with the FBI. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, you know, we're not easy to get to go to work for, and we're going to interview you and hang out with you and talk to you and get to know you in different settings, different people, different situations to make sure you're not crazy mm-hmm. and to make sure you're going to be on game on with the culture and that what you're going to be doing every day makes you smile. And, and we're really going to, you know, lots and lots of interviews. It's it's oftentimes 10 different interviews before you get on board with us. Right. You know, I don't know how to do um, quality interviews fast. I, I don't know. There might be some that can, but the, our, our culture is the same way. People will say it took weeks and weeks and weeks in interviews yeah. upon interviews to get in. And so I think that's good for someone to know. Yeah, sometimes when you when you feel desperate for a hire, that's a really bad time to hire the person in front of you. Every time I get desperate about anything, right after that, I get stupid. Mm-hmm. And you're going to hire, you're, you know, when you get in a hurry because you're greedy or you're, you know, I got to get this done. This has got to get done. It's a mm-hmm. big, the project matters more than anything else. You're going to sacrifice. It's going to take you a long time to clean up the mess you're going to make. Our HR manual is treat other people like you'd want to be treated. So if I was misbehaving towards someone, Maybe I'm not self-aware. Maybe I don't know I'm doing it. And so I, I would want somebody to sit down and tell me. So we sit down and tell them. I thought I was being a nice Christian by dancing around and trying to sugarcoat and trying to be nice in my conversation with someone in a, where I'm trying to affect a change that's, that's got to happen mm-hmm. for them to stay. Well, then they didn't hear me. And then the behavior continues. Well, whose fault is it then? It's my fault. Mm-hmm. And when the behavior continues, then they don't even know Mm -hmm. that I'm getting or other leaders are getting increasingly frustrated with them. And then suddenly somebody just fires them, you know, and we don't do that. Mm -hmm. So we got to treat that guy or that gal. And what what I finally figured out is to be unclear is to be unkind. 
Boy, now that's good. Mm -hmm. And so I've got to sit down. I just got to be real clear. Go. This is a difficult conversation. You're not going to like this conversation. I don't even like having to have this mm -hmm. conversation. But here's what's going on. This, 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 and this. And you can stay, but that stuff can't. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to decide. Mm -hmm. And it may be that you don't want to be here. And that's okay. But we're not going to continue on this path. So those behaviors, that attitude, this lack of performance, whatever it is that's driving you crazy as a leader has to be clearly spelled out and say that, you know, that is leaving mm -hmm. if you're going to stay. Yep. I, I want to just say that again because I don't want people to miss it, but to be unclear is to be unkind. And what's interesting in kind of my earlier season of, um, of leadership, I felt like I, I wanted to be kind to people. I didn't want to hurt them. And so sometimes I would hold back. That's what's unfair. What's yeah. not unfair and what is loving is to be really clear and say, this isn't working. You're not, you need to change such and such. And, uh, and being specific, giving people a chance, that really is good leadership. And, and yeah. uh, again, to be unclear well, is to be is, unkind. This is what, you know, and, and it may be that you choose to say, that's not, I don't want to work here then. Mm -hmm. And we just say, we're French. We, we, you know, <laughs> so we yeah. don't do that here. Right. We bring excellence. Yes. We pay attention to the details. We are kind. Mm -hmm. We don't cuss at each other. Mm -hmm. We don't have temper fit. Yep. We, and if you want to be a we, mm -hmm. then that's what we do. Right. You may not want to be a we. And that's okay. Yeah. So what you're doing, in fact, like just in any time I've been, um, you know, at at your your building, first of all, the uh, the environment is a place you want to be. You walk in and it feels like this is a, it feels uh like I'm excited to be there. The mm -hmm. people seem excited to be there. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of a buzz going around. There's mm -hmm. not, uh, you know, some places you walk in and, and it feels like people don't like each other. They'd rather be anywhere else but there. Uh, at your organization, there's a sense of um, excitement, enthusiasm, passion, direction, motivation, enthusiasm. The list goes on and on. You have a great culture. Thank you. And what you just said, it, you, you gave a list of what we do and what we don't do. And in many ways, that's what culture is. Yeah, it is. How do you take that from your mind, your heart, your head, and bring it into the hearts of everyone else? How do you help them understand what you do, what you value, um, what's important to you? Uh, we talk about it all the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the time, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, in a conflict situation, uh, in a, uh, a staff meeting, in a devotional. Uh, the 14 core values are on the wall, and they are who we are. They're not aspirational. They're not who we want to be. We discovered who we are, and then we wrote it down. Mm -hmm. And this is who we are. We have a self-employed mentality, and that means act like you own the place, mm -hmm. uh, you know. We do our work as unto the Lord. Those are two of our core values. And so you're doing this work for Jesus. So bring it, baby. Mm -hmm. Game on. You bring your best to the throne room. Mm -hmm. You know, it's excellence. Now, it, do we all mess up? Yeah, we all mess up. So we're going to have grace, too. We're going to do that. But this thing of I'm going to do as little work as possible and collect as big a check as possible because this is all about me, you don't fit in. Mm -hmm. we're, we're driving the lane, putting the ball in the hoop. We're bringing it. We're not going to be... Uh, you know, half done Christian label stuff or cr labeled Christian that's that's substandard. Mm -hmm. we, we're going to be the best. Yep. We're going to be the world's best standard. And you get to work with a lot of smart people. If you're in our place, they're creating that and they care really deeply. And they, you know, we all, you know, including they'll come at me. We come at each other over excellence. We got a real low tolerance for people not bringing it for excellence. You got to care. Yep. Yeah. So I, I want to just kind of highlight a few things that you've said and and even things that you didn't say, but are in in your heart. Your great culture is never going to happen by accident. No, there's, it there's, takes a lot there's of work. There's no such thing. And when I ask you, what do you do? You said we talk about it all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and you do, meaning when we're walking down the hallway and I'm with you and you're with your team, I see you building into them. I see you thanking them. Mm -hmm. I see you celebrating their wins. If there's something not right, I see it with a big smile on your face, say, hey, let's do it this way this time. And so it is It is all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. I, someone said uh, vision leaks, mm -hmm. and then I, I added to it vision leaks and values drift. That's just mm -hmm. the way it is, meaning uh, people can know what you're about. One day they come in the next and they get distracted. Uh, values, it's really, it's really incredible incredibly hard to keep three people going in the same direction at the same time, much less 996, whatever team members you have. So I just want to say to those who are listening, uh, you cannot, 
you, you cannot overstate your values. And you know, one other thing I picked up uh, somewhere along the line, when we were about 40 people, we had this great family atmosphere and we had, we had, we'd cleaned the donkeys out. We're running with a stable full of thoroughbreds and, you know, by and large, and we were really, we were, we were game on and we're there for each other. I mean, a guy's house gets hit with a tornado. There's seven trucks show up with chainsaws and, and casseroles and we take care of their kids and somebody's got a pocket full of money and puts them into a hotel. We had tornadoes hit Nashville last year and, uh, man, our guys are all over our team. And nobody had to call anybody. Once they found out Chris's house went down, everybody's at Chris's place, man. And and, we, and if you worked in an area that didn't know Chris, still somebody let you know and you went anyway because that's we're there for each other. So we had that. And then people said, well, you know, you got 50 people, you can do that. But when you got 100, mm-hmm. you can't do that. When you got 200, you can't do that. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you get to 200, you can't. If you still got a family atmosphere, if you still got people caring about each other, if you still got people bringing it that care, their self-employed mentality, you can't you can't do that. And, and I figured out, I tell our team, we do, after 90 days, their first 90 days, we wrap up their onboarding with a time with me in the evening and we get wraps. Mm-hmm. And so wrap with Dave and, and ask me anything. We'll talk about anything. And uh, unless I work with them on a daily basis, that may be the first or second time I've seen them in that 90 days. And so they can talk to me about personal stuff, rumors that they heard, bad things, whatever. It doesn't, we'll talk about anything. But at the end of that, we always tell them, listen, you're now deputized. You are now a we. Mm-hmm. And so when you see something or are something that is not a we, fix it. Make this place the place you want to work. Mm -hmm. Make it the place you want to work by helping other people get there, by doing things for other people, praying for someone that's hurting. Make this the place you want to work. You are now a producer of culture. Mm -hmm. You are not a consumer of it. Mm -hmm. If you sit around and wait on everybody else to do culture instead of producing the kind of place you want it to be, then we're going to be one of those other stupid companies. Right. And and it's so easy for them to end up there. Uh, I like what you said because you've got a you got a really big team and you can't be everywhere, but you are strategically at the right places, meaning you said uh, when you're onboarding, you're there right at the beginning, and so you're setting the tone, mm-hmm. and then you're there at a mile marker for them. At the end of the 90 days, that's the transition. They're moving from you're no longer being onboarded, but now you're a we, and then you're there giving giving them your your the gift of your presence and your approval at those significant moments. And so I'd say to a leader, if you've got three people, you're going to be there at the strategic times. If you've got 3,000 people, your presence at certain times, strategic times, can really do a lot to move the culture forward. Yep. Yep. Let's talk about leading yourself. Some, sometimes, I don't know if, I think it was Maxwell who said, uh, sometimes the most difficult person to lead is yourself. What do you do to, uh, in fact, like for, for example, today, uh, we're together, and I said, hey, we have a quick window. You want to grab a workout together? And you told me that. Told you I got up at, I did mine at yeah, 5.30. You did at 5.30 before, in the before morning. Before I flew over. Yeah, here. so you yeah. so you were you up at 5.30. So you, uh, a lot of people would say, that's impossible. Who in the world would ever get up at 5.30 in the morning? You're get up at 5.30 every morning. You're, <laughs> you're, cho- you're choosing some, uh, you're choosing some things that not everybody chooses. What, how do you, how do you overcome the inertia against good disciplines and lead yourself to the right types of disciplines? Well, I don't always. Um, there are times I do better than others. And, uh, you know, the, the problem is when you don't, you pay for it, mm-hmm. whether it's your physical, the, your energy level, cause you're out of shape. Um, I mean, I looked up after, uh, COVID in the middle of 2020 and I was just straight up fat. I mean, I had, I looked like the Michelin man on the marshmallow man on Ghostbusters, you know, or something. It was ridiculous. And, uh, cause I, and I figured out that from my childhood that when we were working, mom and dad was always fixing up some old house and we'd work 15 hours a day. I mean, they put us over there. We paint all day long or, or shovel or clean or something. And, and they would just feed us mm-hmm. every three or four hours. And they said, if you got fuel, you can keep working. And they constantly been, there was there was food all the time, and so I associate long hours and stress with a lot of food. And so, I, guess what? I mean, we had a lot of long hours and stress, mm-hmm. in, you know, in the COVID situation because we had leadership trying to hold that place together. Mm-hmm. We're in there working our tails off, man. And, and so, uh, I ate like a dadgum pig, man. And 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 I looked up and I went, "This ain't okay." Mm-hmm. 
uh, nothing fits. I'm not buying all new clothes. This is not. This is ridiculous. And so I started a process, and you know, in 26 weeks, I lost 37 pounds. Wow. And um, I still got. Um, I, st- I want to get to 45, so I still got eight more to go. I'm not there, but I had to say, look, what I'm doing is not working. Right. And I know better. I'm 60 years old. This isn't the first time I've lost 37 pounds. I mean, you know, I know better. But I had to say, okay, it's got. I've got to pay the price to get what I want. Mm-hmm. And discipline is you're paying the price to get a better life. Good. I teach people live like no one else. So later you can live like no one mm-hmm. else. And really that apply, that's what discipline is. Bible says it this way. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, mm-hmm. but it yields a harvest of righteousness. So it's easy to be disciplined uh, if you want what it gives you. Well, you had said earlier, and I asked you, you know, how do you, how do you choose the right disciplines? And you, you said, uh, um, sometimes I don't. And you even talked about uh, you know the the poor Michelin season in, mm-hmm. during COVID. What about other types of failure in leadership when you do something you wish you hadn't done, make a decision, and someone wakes up? I'm, I'm sure there's some leaders right now uh, in the middle of this complicated season saying, "I can't believe I did what I did. I kind of blew it." How do you, uh, as a leader, pick yourself up after you've done something stupid and get back in the game? Well, and believe me, in 30 years, I've got a lot of those stories. Um, num- number one, I want to make sure I learn the lesson because it's okay to do something dumb or, or do something stupid, but it is really horrendous to do the same stupid thing twice. Mm-hmm. So I want to make sure that's the, uh, all right, I did that one. I'll never do that one again. I may do another one, but I'm not going to do that one again. I want to I learn the lesson. I want to get an autopsy. What happened there? What were the variables? What was going on that set me up mm-hmm. for that where I didn't do, I wasn't myself. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. I, I was mean to somebody or I was too nice to somebody. I wasn't strong enough. I uh, was lazy. I don't know. Whatever it was I did that was the, that, but what was the thing that, what set me up for that? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the failure on the weight gain that I just went through. So I did, what I did there was an autopsy. Why did I do that? Right. Why did I do that? And Henry Cloud and I laugh about this. He and I have been friends for years. He always says, when I travel, I get fat. <laughs> And Mm -hmm. because you don't work out Mm -hmm. and you eat horribly. It's hard to eat. But what it is, is you're tired Mm -hmm. and you give yourself permission to medicate. Mm -hmm. And so you have to figure out why I'm doing this so that I don't do it again. Mm -hmm. So I don't repeat it. Now, you know, so when it comes to team, if I've screwed up a relational thing, which I have been known to do, um, the, the, um, the idea that you can sit down and, and just say, I'm sorry. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you really are sorry <laughs> is a really powerful thing. So few leaders stop and do that. I remember years ago, uh, one of our PR uh, ladies uh, set up this interview, and she thought it was a uh, a profile, and it was a hit piece. Hmm. And this guy came in with an agenda. So he starts off soft, and then he's sitting in my studio interviewing me. And he starts with these this line of questioning, and I'm like, yeah, I can tell where this is going. And I was dumb. I let it go on. I should have just thrown him out. I should have just said, this, you, you know, you've got in here under false pretenses. This is over. Get out of my building. That's what I should have done. But I finished the interview, and he, he national publication, just ripped me to shreds. And he planned it from day one. It was complete. So when I left that interview, I was mad at myself for not stopping it. I was mad at her for letting it happen because <laughs> I knew this was going to be ugly. And I walked into her office and there were two other of her people sitting there. And I just, this is ridiculous. And I was just angry. And I just vented on her. And um, the next morning, about 445, God woke me up and he said, my son, you are a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you're right, father. To I be am. unclear is to be unkind. And he <laughs> yes. was kind to you. You are a jerk. And I'm, <laughs> yes, I am a jerk. I was a completely jerkified thing to do. Yeah. You, number one, you don't reprimand people in front of their other people. That's absolutely a violation of common sense <laughs> for a leader. Just horrible. This was 20 years ago. I've never done it again. <laughs> Because it was so embarrassing. I'm so embarrassed telling the story right now. I'm kind of red. This is such a f- horrible leadership thing to do. So I went back in, pulled her and the other two people in, and I apologized profusely to her. And uh, and she's like, no, I really deserved it. That was really bad. I said, no, nobody deserved what you got. Mm-hmm. That was not 
that was, you know, yes, we needed to correct this. It was a mistake, but there's a lot of different ways that could have been handled. And I was a jerk and I really am sorry. And that was completely wrong to address this in front of you two. You two experienced bad leadership. You watched it happen and don't ever let somebody do this. What I did, that's awful. And, but, you know, and, and you know, it got all better. It was as good as it could be, but you really can't unring a bell mm -hmm. uh, forever. That's in the back of all three of their minds. I can't, you can't get it out, but, but. But it, it hadn't happened in 20 years either. So I did learn my lesson and I did apologize. And that's really all you can do when you just come. That's one of many foibles mm -hmm. I have done over the years. Well, I like what you did. Not only did you apologize to her, but also to those who witnessed it. So they, they know your humility. And I found there have been a couple of times when I had to apologize to, to, to our whole team, meaning one time I was just in a season of being distracted and overwhelmed and hadn't led well. And it's amazing how much people, people really give a leader grace most of the time if a leader really is sorry. And so I think that's a good, um, good example. You've lasted uh, with integrity. You have, you have a great family, great marriage. You've got a team that loves you. What are, what are some common ingredients that you've had in your life that have helped you go the distance when so many people aren't able to achieve that? Well, I, I, again, I think I had that unbelievable benefit of getting humbled uh, to where I knew I didn't have all the answers. And so uh, I think I think what throws so many people off is this level of arrogance. I have an unbelievable level of confidence mm -hmm. and I'm very passionate and loud. <laughs> and so sometimes that's labeled as arrogance. Mm -hmm. But every time it's all aimed at serving in some way, mm -hmm. I'm lifting, pushing something. And it's very seldom for me personally. So, but I, before there was this arrogance. So most of the time where there's a lack of accountability to integrity, a lack of accountability to humility uh, it is, is because I believe I am the second coming, uh, you know, and, you know, my wife helps with that. You know, sometimes I'll go, look, we got to take this on. We got to do this. And she said, no, that's really not your job. Mm -hmm. You're not Jesus. He's got the full. He's got the full thing. You're supposed to be just doing this other. You're not. You know, it's a Messiah problem. You don't need to do this. You're not the Messiah, and, and so that cuts me loose. So you know, a great, strong, virtuous wife, uh, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart mm -hmm. of her husband safely trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. Mm -hmm. And so I can always go in. We can always sit down, and you know, we're Ramses. We're hillbillies. We fight. We 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 fight for sport. We just enjoy a good argument, you know, and so we do that as a way of processing decisions at Ramsey. You know, we get we we just scrap around and argue, and nobody's ever mad. We're just we we'll argue just to see. I'll take the other position just so there's an argument, you know, and, and that's a good way for me to process decisions, and that means you've got people in your life that are talking. You're not the only one talking. Good, good. In your uh, in your early twenties, you amassed four million dollars worth of real estate. And you ended up losing that, but I think you had a, you had a probably a different definition of success at that point. You, success for you then was probably the accumulation of wealth, and yeah. you've obviously still succeeded in that avenue. But you probably have a little different view of what success is at this stage of life. Um, what would you say success really is today, Ramsey? Earl Nightingale says that the, the definition of success used to say it is the progressive realization of a worthy goal. Um, so, uh, for me, it, it, it's, it's just going to be that whatever we're doing, whether it's Papa Dave with a six month old on my knee, um, or whether it's on a stage with 250,000 people watching a live stream, whatever it is, uh, it needs to be wide open. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to be holding it back. You need to go for it. And so, you know, just... And if you're not doing that, then do something to jolt it. Like, you know, I turned 60 last September, so I thought, I, I got to do something. This is, I got to, I've always barefoot water skied. You were joking about that. So I said, okay, we're going barefoot when I turn 60. I got to know, I got to have that on the list. So we did a skydive, mm. a bunch of us. My son went with me and a bunch of my buddies. That was a trip. And uh, I'd never done that. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> 
And uh, I did the SEAL Team exercise where I went out with SEAL Team 6, and I was one of the bad guys, and they're shooting at you. And so I had, a, I had this unbelievable week and a half of adrenaline dump from all these different <laughs> things I was doing, from jumping out of airplanes to getting shot at by the SEALs with paint. But um, – and, and then, you know, barefoot and behind a boat at 40 miles an hour or whatever. So, you know, just do something. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, so what I, what for me success is, is this, this embracing it all. Just, you know, God's got so many wonderful things that being a grandpa, being a husband, being a leader, running a business in America, mm -hmm. uh, being in ministry, leading people to the Lord. I mean, that, whatever it is you're doing, just wide open. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I want on my tombstone. Well, every time I've been with you, you're you're embracing it all. It seems like you've always got some kind of new and uh, and crazy venture, and so I, I, I want to applaud you on that. And uh, I, I want to just have some fun, help people get to know maybe a different side of you. Are you game for a little lightning round of questions? Oh, sure. Okay, I'm going to fire some at you, and uh, you can answer as many of these as quickly and as honestly as you can. Super important question that a lot of people have been hanging on the edge of their seats waiting to hear. What's the best 1980s rock band, according to Dave Ramsey? Well, for me, it'd be the 70s, and that's the Eagles. The Eagles, and they bleed over to the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, 90s and 2000s, yeah. Favorite dessert, the one that was kicking you during COVID. What's your favorite <laughs> dessert? Chocolate donuts. Come on. <laughs> uh, dogs or cats? Oh, dogs. All the way. Uh, form of communication. Are we texting? Are we talking? Or are we emailing? Email. Email. I knew that one. You email. You're the lightning fast emailer. Uh, childhood nickname. What do they call you? Uh, oh no, David. I, 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 you know, I was David. David. Until I was twenty something. David. I changed it to Thanks Dave. for being on so, David Ramsey. The David Ramsey. Scale of one and, to ten. My wife says that it's a four syllable word. David. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, scale of one to ten. How good of a driver are you? I'm a great driver, and I drive real fast. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna say a two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> leadership pet peeve. What gets on your nerves and drives you crazy? Disloyalty. Hmm. Quirky habit. What is the thing that you do that makes other people crazy? I jump ahead to the solution instead of hearing the thing all the way through. Gotcha. And uh, on a serious note to wrap it up, uh, something that you're most proud of in this season of your life? My kid. Yeah. And you should be. And your grandkids. And my grandkids. And there's more of them coming. Keep coming. They keep coming. They're <laughs> popping out like popcorn. <laughs> Life is good. Life is good. Well, Dave, David, <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for your friendship and you for too, your leadership. And uh, I wanted to talk about a few things you have going. You've got a lot of tools, not just to help people financially, but um, in their leadership, in their goals. And so, a few things to highlight. If they go to DaveRamsey.com, mm -hmm. they can find about out about Ramsey Plus. Can you tell us what all is available in Ramsey Plus? So Ramsey Plus encompasses everything you need to continue to walk not only out of debt, but into wealth and into outrageous generosity. Um, it starts with the Every Dollar Budgeting app, a premium version connecting to your bank. It has Financial Peace University, The Legacy Journey, uh, extra classes by Rachel and by Rachel Cruz and Chris Hogan on budgeting, on uh, investing, uh, all kinds of extra things in addition to Financial Peace University. It, it's got the Baby Steps Tracker app so you can follow and track your progress and know where you are and get those quick wins and know where and, and know that you're moving along. Uh, it, it's got community uh, where you plug in and, and we, all our coaches, we've got about 5,000 coaches now that we've trained and the, a lot of them are available to ask a coach mm -hmm. a question and all that's included. It's a ridiculous value because it's about the same price as Financial Peace University was in the past. I've done Financial Peace three times with Amy, uh, led it before, it's so valuable and you get all the other additional tools. That's Ramsey Plus and then we're gonna be together on uh, May 16th through 19th for Entree Leadership. So. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> that's the plan, right? That is. Yeah, and I, I listed down here, you've got uh, Patrick Lintoni coming, Marcus Buckingham, Simon Sinek, Christy Wright, Chris Hogan, and uh, of course you'll be there and mm -hmm. others teach you on leadership. And uh, there's information on all this at DaveRamsey.com. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you. To our community, I just want to remind you that you can get uh, free early access 
to the five-part leadership masterclass. It's called How the Best Leaders Think. Go to craigrochelle.com and there's all sorts of details there. You can also download the, uh, the leader guide at that site and then you can find out how to get the free early access to the masterclass. We say it all the time and you do this so well. As leaders, we feel pressure, but we always tell people this, that be yourself because people would rather follow a leader who's always real than one who's always right. 